Like, they love her, but they don't appreciate her for who she is. And then we get to, like, part two of the story, and my heart got ripped out. A strange novel. This was written really weirdly. I enjoyed it for the most part. Just didn't give what I wanted it to give. Hey besties, it's Joel, and this week we're going to be reading Translated Fiction by Women in celebration of Women in Translation Month. I hope you're all doing very well today and you're staying hydrated because I literally just finished my cup of water. So if you've yet to take a drink of water, please do so. And if you've yet to check out my Instagram nor my Twitter, I would highly recommend you go and do that because I post some extra bookish content that you're not gonna see here. I'm super excited to be delving into Translated Fiction once again because I had so much fun with the last Translated Fiction video and I did say in that video that I was going to create one for Women in Translation Month so I'm super excited to be creating this one today and focusing on women writers as well because as the feminists that we all are here it's very important that we celebrate women and other marginalized agendas as well. But before we begin today's video I do have a very quick message from today's sponsor and so I'm gonna throw it on over to Sponsor Joel in order to tell you all about that. Hey besties I'd like to thank GlassesUSA.com for sponsoring today's video. By cutting out the middleman, GlassesUSA.com offers prescription glasses up to 70% off retail prices, which you can shop from the comfort of your own home. They offer over 4,000 designs of eyeglasses and sunglasses as well, from their in-house brands to their designer brands. It's just showcasing a diverse range of styles, and there's just so much to choose from. It's such a wide range that they also offer glasses in different specialities as well, from sports glasses to kids' glasses. It's just, it's just great. And also GlassUSA.com offers blue light blocking on any of their eyeglasses frames, which is basically primarily what I use my glasses for because I'm working like long hours in front of the computer doing editing. And so the blue light really helps reduce those headaches. I was fortunate enough to be able to choose four pairs of glasses from GlassUSA.com and I'm going to be able to show them to you today. They arrived in this little blue carry case and it's just so cute and they really keep my glasses secure as well. And so we have the ones that I'm wearing right now, which are the M6644. I just like how small they are on my face and like they just complete the look really nicely. And when I pair it with like my sweater vest and shirt and like uh, my brown trousers as well, it really gives off the dark academia look very nicely. These ones are the Atoto Professor. I just like how slightly bigger they are, but I also really like the tortoise shell color on it. I just feel like it just, you know, it just makes me look really cute. But my sister always steals these because these ones also have blue light blocking on them. And so when she's doing work on her computer, she's like, oh, I need these. And so I basically always find them in her room. These ones are the Ototo Pietro. And I really like these because they just basically go with any outfit and they're quite basic in their like silver style frame as well. And then finally, you know me, I had to get a pair of sunglasses. And so we have the Ototo Olympio. I just love these because, I don't know, they just make me feel amazing. And so a complete pair of glasses, which includes the frame and the lenses, start from $30, and free basic prescription lenses are included with every frame. So if that interests you, I'll have a link in my description, which you can use to go to glassusa.com to view the wonderful selection that they have. And I'll also have the glasses that I'm wearing today linked in the description down below for you so that you can browse those if you like any of the pairs that I've showcased today. And again, a massive thank you to GlassUSA.com for sponsoring today's video. I hope that you'll be able to find the glasses that are right for you. And so for now, we're going to get back to the beautiful Women in Translation. Okay, so Women in Translation was a project that has existed since late 2013 with the goal of promoting women writers from around the world writing in languages other than English. But also, the project also promotes underrepresented trans, non-binary, and intersex writers as well, unless they otherwise ask not to be included in the gendered project. So it's great to see that the Women in Translation project is also encompassing other gender identities as well within their work. But Women in Translation Month specifically has been taking place every August since 2014, with the main aim to be reading works written by women in other languages, as less than 31% of books translated into English are written by women, and so it's very important that we work to highlight and celebrate these voices within literature. And the Women in Translation website has a bunch of resources and information for you to go and browse, so I'll have that linked in the description down below. And it's just so 
amazing because it even includes lists of released titles so that you don't have to go out and try and figure out like whether a book is translated or not. They have all of the information there ready to go for you. And I just think it's super awesome and amazing. But for me personally, I picked five books. One is technically a reread, but I picked five books that I want to read this week because I want to celebrate Women in Translation Month. And I think these five books are really good to do that. Plus, a lot of you did suggest a few of these books through the Instagram story that I posted a couple of weeks ago. And so I'm very, very excited to be getting into this. The five books that I'm going to be reading in this video are Convenience Store Woman by Sayako Murata, Kitchen by Banana Yoshimoto, The Vegetarian by Hong Kong, Things We Lost in the Fire by Mariana Enriquez, and finally, this author was literally requested the most, and that was Eva Luna by Isabel Allende. And so I'm really, really excited to be getting into all of these. And the languages that these have been translated from are Japanese for Convenience Store Women and Kitchen, Korean for The Vegetarian, and Spanish for Things We Lost in the Fire and Eva Luna. And so I'm really excited to be delving into all of these novels. But the very first one that we're going to be delving into is Convenience Store Woman by Sayaka Murata. This one I have read before. I read it a couple of years ago, actually. And I really enjoyed it. I really liked it. So it's going to be really interesting to see like how I take it like a couple of years later after reading it. And I'm really looking forward to it because I also, I do have Sayaka Murata's other novel, Earthlings. And I haven't read that yet, but I do think I'm going to read that quite soon. So Convenience the woman basically follows Kaiko, who doesn't exactly fit in, and at 36 years old, she hasn't got a boyfriend, and she's been working in the same convenience store since she was 18, basically. And her parents wish that she gets a better job, her friends wonder why she hasn't been married yet, but Kaiko knows that the one thing that makes her happy, and nothing and no one is going to take her away from her convenience store. And so I'm really, really excited by this, because it definitely gives a slight commentary on capitalism, it definitely feels like it does a whole commentary in and of itself, and I I think Japanese fiction does this super well in making like subtle commentaries without making the thing glaringly obvious. And so I'm really excited to be rereading Convenience Store Woman. And the rest of these picks as well just sound super amazing and I can't wait to read them along with you. And so I'm gonna get to reading Convenience Store Woman by Sayaka Murata and I'll return once I've finished, give my whole thoughts and opinions and you know the drill. It's what we do. I'll see you in a bit, besties. Hey, besties. So I finished Convenience Store Woman and also I got a haircut. But before we get into it, I do need to quickly mention that the translator for Convenience Store Woman was Ginny Tapley Takamori. Forgot to mention the translator's name. I apologize. I came out of this with a very different conclusion than when I first read it when I was 18. I initially read this and thought like, oh, this is an anti-capitalist piece. This talks about the fact that Kaiko has become so enmeshed with the convenience store that she hasn't really been able to live a life outside of the store. And it's really sad and, you know, capitalism is bad. Whilst capitalism is it's still bad, I really think that this is actually more of an anti-conformatist piece as opposed to an anti-capitalism piece. Conformity being where you have to adhere to certain standards and certain lifestyle choices in order to appear normal and human to other people. Kaiko is a very much autistically neurodivergent coded character. And I say this because of an article by Nisha Dolan, who is the author of Exciting Times in The Guardian, who resonated a lot with Kaiko and helped her gain confidence as an autistic writer. And a lot of autistic reviewers have also pointed out that they feel like Kaiko can be autistically coded in some way. And I do feel like as someone who is not autistic but is neurodivergent, I definitely resonated a lot with Kaiko's story and just the way that she navigates the world that she is set in because she's very much trying to conform to certain standards that don't really fit with her. It's like jagged puzzle pieces that won't fit. She just doesn't fit the mold that society wants her to be in. And so she relies on the convenience store and the words and lessons that she learns from the convenience store and the mannerisms and attitudes of the people around her in order to fit in. And she feels like the only way she can fit in within society is to work in that convenience store. And yes, whilst it is a bit sad that she can't do anything else and she doesn't feel confident enough to do anything else. It is a constant in her life that she relies on and for that I am happy for her to have that constant because as someone, again, who is neurodivergent, I have constants in my life that I rely on and it, they're great because they keep me grounded and they keep me fixed. It helps me from not spiralling out of control. I also feel like with Convenience Store Women, it spoke a lot about how we as people set certain standards on other people and also have fixed values and assets that kind of don't 
fit certain molds. Like, I feel like this is an experience that resonates with a lot of people of color, resonates with a lot of neurodivergent people, but also queer people as a whole, because there are standards and attitudes and bits of conformity that we must adhere to, and that sometimes our identities don't resonate with that, and the way that we feel as people don't resonate with that. And so for a society to evolve, sometimes we have to break conformity and do something out of the ordinary in order to just help progress society along a bit more. And I think that it's amazing. This is definitely an anti-conformatist novel because of Kaiko and the way that she tries to force herself to conform to society by doing certain attitudes and certain actions. And like everyone around her just kind of always comments about the fact that she's not really normal, that she just needs to like do certain things to appear more normal. And I think it's quite sad about that because her friends don't accept her for who she is and instead trying to push Kaiko into a mold that is for them. And she has shit friends. She has a shit family. Like they all just don't, like they love her, but they don't appreciate her for who she is because they all feel sorry for her for working at this convenience store all the time when really it's giving her the only like sense of stability that she's probably had since she was 18. It's definitely a gripping story. And I definitely think there's a lot you could analyze from this. And there is just so much you could take from it. I just think it's such a cleverly written novella. Like it does still conform to the anti-capitalist values because of the fact that Kaiko usually talks about how someone will just be replaced if someone leaves. There's the the wheel is ever grinding. The, the shop is open for 24 hours. There's night shifts, like everyone is struggling. It just shows like one, the consequences of capitalism, but also two, it shows trying to fit people into certain malls just doesn't always work. And Shiraha also talks about this to Kaiko during the end of the novel, how we've been like this since the Stone Age and how we've just enforced certain values onto people because of who they are. And that like the mall just needs to be broken. The mall just needs to be tossed out and like reforged into just a fluid state because we should just be flexible in like the standards that we set for other people. Convenience Store Woman shows the consequences of trying to force yourself to conform to a society that doesn't understand you. It's amazing. And I, it, it's a really good novel. I would recommend it. I think it can be quite slow in the beginning for some people. We'll now be moving on to Kitchen by Banana Yoshimoto. And it was translated into the English by Megan Bacchus. And I'm quite excited to read this because Kitchen is two tales about mothers, transsexuality, bereavement, kitchens, love, and tragedy. And so I'm very much looking forward to getting into this. I've heard so many good things about Kitchen. I think a lot of you in the comments of my previous translated fiction video were really looking forward to me reading Kitchen because I was going to read it in that video but I didn't manage to get through it in the time but I'm gonna be reading it now and I'm really excited about it so I think it's gonna be really great. I love the cover design. It just says Faber designed the cover and it is a gorgeous cover. That I think it's, I don't know, I'm just so excited. So we have two short stories. One is called Kitchen and the other is called Moonlight Shadow and so I'm very excited for it because I think it's gonna be really great. I'm gonna get to reading Kitchen and I'll be back once I finished my whole thoughts and opinions. See you in a bit, besties. Hello, besties. So I finished Kitchen by Banana Yoshimoto, and this was actually two stories. So we had Kitchen and we had Moonlight Shadow. I'm gonna talk about them both separately. And Kitchen, oh my gosh, it was so good. I could write an entire essay about the relationship between food and love, and just the way food represents love, and the way that just these characters within Kitchen use food to communicate with one another and just show appreciation for one another, but also just how much like Kitchens can just bring so much emotion and stuff and I know that I have a weird obsession with like kitchen stuff and I guess that's the adult coming out in me now which I really don't like but this was just so wholesome in a way like we really got to see characters that accepted a transgender character and like although this does have a bit of dated language it's still very like heartwarming to see and I think that it's just it was just so nice and it was so amazing and I think even within like the small amount of pages it was just really nice to kind of read this story and read this tale and then we get to like chapter two of the story, like part two of the story, and my heart got ripped out. Like the beginning of part two was like, and I was like, excuse me. I was like, what happened? Hello, what? And it affected, I was just, I was, I almost cried. I was like, what? Like this, it was just so jarring that I was just like, oh, 
But then you remember, like, death is like that sometimes. Like, death just comes out of nowhere. You don't expect death to happen. You don't anticipate it. You can't be prepared for it. It just happens. And it was just weird reading that and just suddenly someone dying. It was very hard. And I wouldn't say this falls into specific tropes because of the way the death is handled. And I think the way that the death is used, I don't think it falls into specific tropes. I think that the way that these characters handle death. In both stories, handle death and handle their emotions are very real and very visceral. We see this in Moonlight Shadow where the main character is dealing with the death of her boyfriend. The whole story in Moonlight Shadow was a bit more mystical and a bit more like fabulistic in a sense, but it was it was very much a really comforting read in a way. Seeing one of the main characters wear his girlfriend's school uniform because it makes him feel close to her again. It's something that a lot of people do to feel still connected to that person. And I don't know, both of these stories just dealt with love and tragedy and death in their own way, one through the perspective of kitchens and food as a way of comfort and a way of solace, and then the other through a mystical sort of means, but also trying to find those connections with other people once people die. And I think both stories just handled this so beautifully well, and I think Banana Yoshimoto is such a talented writer. It was just so beautiful to read this. I cannot wait to check out more of Banana Yoshimoto's work. I think that this was just stunning. Will then be moving Moving on to The Vegetarian by Hong Kong, and this has been translated into the English by Deborah Smith and I'm really excited for it because it's a darkly beautiful modern classic about rebellion, eroticism, and the female body. One of the most extraordinary books you will ever read, according to the back. And so I'm very excited. I've seen a lot of people recommend this in the Translate Fiction by Women sticker that I put on Instagram a few weeks ago, and it did win the International Man Booker Prize of 2016, so it has to be good in some way to merit this award. And I think it's just gonna be really cool, really awesome, and I'm really excited to read it. I'm not sure what I'm expecting from the vegetarian, something to do with like flesh in a way. I'm not gonna go with like Augustina Pasterica's Tender as the Flesh, but I feel like this is gonna have something to do with flesh meat in some sort of way or the lack thereof. But one of the quotes is both terrifying and terrific. And so I'm excited. I'm very excited. Also, I'm actually planning to try and read like two more books today. So I think I'm gonna try to get through The Vegetarian now and then I'm gonna get through uh, Things We Lost in the Fire today because I'm getting my vaccine tomorrow and I might be ill afterwards because it is my second jab. So I'm like, I, I just kind of want to stay in bed tomorrow and read Evil Luna and edit in bed. Um, So yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and make sure that I finish these books by then. So yeah. See you in a bit. Good evening, besties. It is currently half ten at night, and I finished The Vegetarian by Hong Kong. This was so weird. This was a strange novel. This was written really weirdly, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed how it was written. I enjoyed the exploration that we got to see through vegetarianism and how it kind of talks about innocence and lack thereof innocence and how it is impossible to be completely innocent in this world because of certain things that we do in our life. This explored sexuality, morality in such a very nuanced way. I do have some critiques about this book, which I will get into later, but positives. I think that this delved really well into the exploration of the objectification of women's bodies. I think particularly from the gazes that we see and the perspectives that we see throughout this, we see how women's bodies are often objectified, how the patriarchal society of South Korea really perpetuates the objectification of women, and how this just kind of allows certain things to happen, and how these women, when they gain ownership of their bodies and of their sexuality and of their power, they are punished for it. And it's very intriguing to see that. Also, we get to see how if we enact on our desires, we can also be punished upon that because they're not always is morally correct and also proves the fact that we are not completely innocent and that when we do feel guilty about what we've done they can often lead us to irreparable places as we see but I also do have my critiques about this novel because I feel like this pandered to the male gaze a bit too much if you got young A's perspective in this book I feel like it would have added so much more nuance and added so much more depth to the conversation about objectification of women and I think seeing like both her husband who is a piece 
of crap and also uh, her brother-in-law's perspective. I feel like it just bolstered the male gaze perspective a bit too much for me. We do get to see a little bit of her perspective with the dream sequences, but it's not that much. And I feel like exploring her mind would have been so much more, although it could have been purposeful because of the fact that we don't get to see what she's thinking, what she's feeling. And so we're forced to watch this perspective of a male objectifying her, which could also be used to bolster the uh, themes of this novel a bit more. I mean, this kind of also reminded me of Jane Eyre a little, where we don't get to see Bertha Mason and her perspective on everything, and she's just merely treated as the mad woman. I feel like Hong Kong's The Vegetarian does this in a similar way, where we don't get to see Yong Eyre's perspective, but everyone's immediately just convinced that she's a mad person because she becomes a vegetarian, and everyone really goes to some form of extremes to try and get her to eat meat, and I think whilst it is kind of unbelievable in some instances, it's kind of like this extreme measures that kind of perpetuate these themes that Hong Kong is trying to perform and show in this novel. And I think it's done quite well. And I can definitely see why this won the International Man Booker Prize because it's definitely unsettling. It's definitely um, a weird read, but also plays with prose so wonderfully and theme, the themes of this book so wonderfully. It is definitely like a good read, but it's definitely one that is not for everyone. And I can definitely see this being quite a polarizing read for many. We'll now be moving on to Things We Lost in the Fire by Mariana Enriquez, which was translated into the English language by Megan McDowell. And this is 12 stories of ghosts, demons, and wild women, of sharp-toothed children and stolen skulls. And so I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued. I am a bit excited for it, but it also does say it transports the reader to the crime-ridden streets of post-dictatorship Buenos Aires, where exhausted fathers conjure up child killers, and young women, tired of suffering in silence, decide there's nothing left to do but sat themselves on fire. I mean, maybe it wasn't the best decision to go from the vegetarian to this, but I think I'm gonna try and read like a few of the stories tonight and then carry on in the morning and finish this book tomorrow morning. And then I'm gonna be reading the final book and then we can wrap this whole thing up and it'll be great. Uh, I'm gonna get to reading Things We Lost in the Fire. I think the cover design is actually really cool. The cover image was done by Ready Mead Images, but then the cover design was done by Anna Morrison. And I think it's just such like a kind of mesmerizing cover. It kind of reminds me of the cover of A Little Life. I'm gonna get to reading and I'll get back with you once I finished. And again, give my whole thoughts and feelings and we'll see what happens. Hello besties, so I finished Things We Lost in the Fire by Mariana Enriquez and I enjoyed it for the most part. I think like the horror aspects were kind of good and I think like the stories were very interesting in and of itself. We definitely got to explore various avenues of stories and got introduced to a multitude of different characters and just see like how th twisted things can get. And I think the Argentinian setting was also very nice to like be in. I do have my caveats about this book. I do think some of the stories very used dated terms, like in the very first story, we got a similar wording that was in a uh, kitchen and that one was written in the 80s, this one's written in 2016 and I'm just like oh, we shouldn't really be using certain words nowadays because they can be offensive and so we should really be using other words and then I just think a lot of these stories just ended abruptly, like we got to the like tensional apex of the story and then the story just ended there was no resolution or payoff, it just kind of ended and it just left me feeling like ah, this is not really sad satisfying me. And I think a lot of the horror elements relied on like the deformity of children and adults and I think like this is quite a nice collection of stories however there are a few things that I'm a bit like <sighs> Ooh, ooh, ooh. I think I'd give this like a three stars overall. It was, it was good. It was just a mixed bag. And I feel like a lot of people on Goodreads also agree. Like some people really love this collection of stories, but some people also don't feel like it delivered what it could have delivered. We'll now be moving on to the final book, and that is Eva Luna by Isabel Allende. Now, a lot of you have recommended me Isabel Allende multiple times, and I'm just super excited. This has been translated from the Spanish by Margaret Sayers Peren, and the cover art was by Elsa Mora, and it's like this really cool like paper art that I'm really, really intrigued by, and apparently according to the Evening Standard, it's a heartfelt novel powerful enough to make a dictator cry. So, um, I'm, I'm not prepared. 
It's the sweet and sinister story of an orphan who beguiles the world with her astonishing visions, triumphing over the worst of adversity and bringing light to a dark place. And so I'm really excited to read it, and I think it's just gonna be really cute, really sweet, and it's just gonna be great. And I'm intrigued by it. I'm gonna get to reading Eva Luna, and I will be back to uh, give you my whole thoughts and wrap up this translated fiction video. See you in a bit, besties. Hello, besties. I'm vaccinated. I have my plaster there. And I finished Eva Luna by Isabel Allende. I enjoyed this. I think I'm gonna rate this three and a half stars. I have my reasons. But positives, I love magical realism. I love the expositional style storytelling that we get in this. It's really nice. It's really great. And it adds to like the mysticism and the magicalness of this book. I think that Eva Luna was just a really great read. It reminds me a lot of Pamela by Samuel Richardson, which is like an 18th century text. But also I feel like this novel kind of fails in certain regards in terms of the romance because it does feel very rushed in the end. I think the start of the story is much stronger longer than where it ends, just didn't give what I wanted it to give near the end. This also suffers from having like outdated language as well. This was written in the 80s, so I can I can like forgive some use of language, but I think if this was to be like republished in like a new edition, it definitely needs to be gone through and like updated some of the language because again, I just, I, I don't get what it is with having like outdated language change it so it's not offensive. Like I get like wanting to like protect the integrity of art and whatever but at the same time if it's literally just changing one word for another word so that it literally means the same exact thing but is just not as offensive anymore i don't see the problem with that there was just the treatment of some of the black characters within this that i was a bit like but apart from that, I think that this was just a really nice tale. I think that Eva Luna's character, someone who loves like books and just a bunch of different forms of art was just super interesting. I think that just her character arc through everything was very interesting. Also just like romance within, like I think a lot of these books take romance in different ways. Like Kitchen took romance in the form of food. This takes romance in the form of like, kind of like passionate, like the passions. I feel like this is very much like the passions. And I definitely think like it was interesting how but I would agree with a lot of the reviews on Goodreads that say that Eva Luna's character at, like art kind of like halts at like 75% because then the tale becomes much more focused around the men. And then it just, it's just like, no, give Eva Luna what she deserves. Give her a full character arc. But yeah, but I'm definitely excited to read more Isabella Lende works because I know a lot of people have recommended The House of Spirits and that is presumably probably her best piece of work according to some people. So I'm excited to read that eventually as well. So overall, we have read five five spectacular pieces of translated fiction by women this week. And I really enjoyed it. I think that like translated fiction is something that is amazing. There's an added nuance to translated fiction that I can't describe. And the way the language is used is just so beautiful. And I would love to like know the native languages so I could read them in its native language. But like, I do not have the time to learn so many languages. And I'm already trying to learn Korean at the moment. The Duolingo owl is basically shouting at me every five days to like continue my lessons. And you know, I. I'm already sad that the Mark of Athena's new job as the Duolingo Owl is like harassing me, but you know, we're just gonna keep moving. We're just gonna keep going. But yeah, so I I just really like translated fiction. And I, I definitely feel like women in translation is something that we should celebrate more of. I would definitely love to do more translated fiction in the future. So if you have any more recommendations, let me know. If I was to give like my favorite book from this video, I think it would be a draw between Convenience Store Woman and Kitchen by Banana Yoshimoto. These two were just so good. And amazing. I think there's like a special place for Japanese translated fiction in my heart because I feel like they just capture a lot of nuance and emotion that like I just physically can't describe but they just get so beautifully and like it just hits me in a way that like makes me super emotional. Again a massive thank you to GlassesUSA.com for sponsoring today's video. If you want to check all of the selections of these beautiful pairs of glasses out you can check them out in the description down below. If you like this video be sure to give it a thumbs up and if you're new here be sure to click that subscribe button so that you're notified whenever I upload next. If you want to see any other of my social medias, I have them all linked in the description down below for you, including my coffee link, which can be used to help donate a very helpful tip, which can be used to improve this channel further. And so yeah, I guess until the next time, bye besties.